school children in any area where the Germans came through were taught the difference between what was known as Armvogel and Brustvogel. The SS wore eagles on their arms so they could be differentiated uh, from the army troops. I can't find this. See if I can find a picture of one of these men. There we are. The SS eagle here and the army eagle here. Their ranking system was different. They wore lightning bolts on their collars. The names of ranks were different. So, for example, a sergeant in the German army was known as a Feldwebel, and the SS was known as a Scharführer. A, um, a, a Leutnant, that's a lieutenant, was known as an Untersturmführer. As much as possible, they differentiated themselves from the army uh, along whose side they fought. Their weapons were by and large the same, um, and they were usually better equipped and had more ammunition to spend, at least if I'm to believe this veteran of the 2nd Infantry Division. They were not sparing with their ammunition. They also very quickly gained a reputation for atrocity. This man was named Knöchlein, Fritz Knöchlein. In France in 1940, when the British Expeditionary Force were being thrown back to Dunkirk, this, man, uh, this man's uh, unit uh, experienced severe casualties at the hands of the Royal Norfolk Regiment. Afterwards, the Royal Norfolk Regiment, or a company of it, was overrun and its members, having surrendered, were then executed. Um, this is a blurry picture, but all of these men are members of the Royal Norfolk who were shot by Knirklein's men. Knirklein was eventually caught up with and did pay for his crimes. All armies, no matter what their nationality, sometimes commit what could be termed atrocities in war. These atrocities are usually committed by small groups acting spontaneously and without the clearance from higher authorities. I hope that doesn't sound controversial. I mean it only to sound realistic and by sharp contrast to the SS. Few if any of those armies however committed atrocities as a matter of course. I hesitate to say that the Waffen-SS were understanding orders to commit atrocities. By that I mean shooting prisoners, shooting civilians. But I can find very few battles in which the Waffen-SS were engaged in which atrocities were not committed. One notable exception would be Arnhem, where British paratroopers landed trying to secure a bridge um, and were relatively well treated by the SS in the middle of whose division they landed. The Einsatzgruppen, who also travelled, who often travelled in the wake of the SS and of the death's head groups who operated the death camps, their very purpose was to commit atrocities. Some apologists for the SS have sought to differentiate the culpability of the Waffen-SS from other branches of that organisation. Such distinctions are, in my own opinion, not supported by facts. What does, what does differentiate them from other branches of service in the German army was that they were, by design and practice, engaged in a race war. These notions of racial purity and racial compatibility within the SS were very quickly subverted by the need for more manpower to fight the war. That's why this father at the very end um, could join the Waffen-SS at the age of 17, which would have been unthinkable at the outbreak of the war. This subversion of their racial integrity, if you want to call it that, was not only because of their need for more Germans, but for their need for foreign volunteers. As John Keegan, um, one of the great historians of the First and Second World War, wrote of the Aryan Superman, most Germans remain blonde like Hitler, tall like Goebbels, and thin like Hermann Goering. <laughs> <laughs> In every country Germans invaded, the call went out for volunteers. Dutch. That's actually it's French, but it's for the Belgians. This, believe it or not, is an appeal to British prisoners of war to join the SS. And I'm embarrassed to say that they did not come out of that empty-handed. The selling point was not so much a love of Germany as a hatred of communism. And this call was answered. In France, the 33rd Waffen Grenadier Division, Charlemagne. In Belgium, the Wallonian Division. Holland, the Nederland Division. Austria, Hungary, Scandinavia. And even on paper, the SS Sturm Brigade, Britishers Freikorps. So mistrusted by Hermann Goering that he refused to give them guns. <laughs> and they were said to have numbered under 20. Um, 
<laughs> These divisions represented, if not racial equals in the minds of the SS, then at least racial partners. However, other divisions raised in the Balkans, such as the fez-wearing Muslim Bosnians of the 13th Waffen Grenadier Division, Hanshar, bore no resemblance to the original mandates of the SS. You can see very quickly how the original ideas of this organization, the streamlining of it, became very muddied and only added to the, uh, the notoriety they achieved during this war. In all, there were 38 divisions of the SS. Some never achieved divisional strength, others existed mostly on paper, while others, such as the Leibstandart Adolf Hitler, the Das Reich Division, and the Totenkopf Division, were casualties many times over. The first SS is said to have been numerically replaced more than five times during the war. Although the role of the Waffen SS was significant wherever they fought, they were not deployed in all the German theatres. For example, they were not engaged in North Africa. They saw limited fighting in Italy, Corsica, and Greece, and in the campaign for Norway. The majority of action seen by the Waffen SS was in Russia, Eastern Europe, Normandy, and the Ardennes Offensive. Following the failure of the Ardennes Offensive, most of these divisions were withdrawn to the Eastern Front in a futile attempt to stem the tide of the Red Army's advance into Europe. And then what happened to them? In the closing stages of the war, the role of the SS was a combination of blocking moves against the Soviets and forced marches to reach the Anglo-American lines. The average SS man knew exactly what was waiting for him if he fell into Russian captivity. And they were not wrong. Very few SS men taken prisoner by the Russians actually survived. And even if they did change uniform, they were literally marked for death by this. This is a blood group marking. It would be here. You're tattooed with your blood group. Um, and this could not be removed. Russian soldiers regularly got German soldiers to strip to their waists and hold up their arms. And if a blood group marking was found, it meant that they were members of the SS and they would be summarily executed. Reichsfuhrer der SS Heinrich Himmler was caught trying to pass through British lines dressed as an ordinary soldier. And these are in the last days of Hitler's, of Hitler's rule in the bunker. Ironically, what aroused the suspicions of the British military police was the fact that he had too much paperwork and all of it was in order. <laughs> <laughs> By that stage of the war, most German soldiers had only their pay books and dog tags to identify themselves. When Himmler realized that he was about to be identified, he bit into a glass vial of potassium cyanide. Many SS divisions, such as the Hitler Jugend and the Totenkopf, <coughs> Um, did manage to reach Anglo-American lines. This did not guarantee them safety or even their lives. Many of these soldiers, exhausted by 30-mile marches on half rations day after day, spreading over a period of months, were then herded into open fields and left for weeks with no cover from the elements except their shredded rain capes. I have read that as many as 10,000 may have died in Anglo-American captivity mostly from neglect. For others, death was also certain. The entire Totenkopf division, this is a division that uh, prided itself on its ruthlessness, was handed back to the Russians and most of its members were either shot or died in gulags. If there were survivors, they numbered perhaps in the low hundreds. As you know, many high-ranking officers were tried at Nuremberg one of the most interesting trials was of a man named Jochen Piper, who was at least in some sense responsible for what was known as the Malmedy Massacre, something you might have heard of. Just outside the Belgian town of Malmedy is a little village called Bognes, and there is a field. I've seen it. It's, a, it's the most unremarkable little patch of ground, and you would drive right past it and never notice it unless you knew what had happened there. It was in this field, during one of the furthest advance points of the German, uh, the German thrust into the Ardennes, that a group of Americans were gathered, having surrendered in this field. 